Good afternoon. I'm Danielle Conway. This is Life in the Law on the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. My guest today is Professor Virginia Hench. We're going to be talking about the Hawaii Innocence Project at the William S. Richardson School of Law in Education and Social Justice. I'm very happy to have Professor Hench with me today. She lets me call her Jenny. <laughs> and the reason I'm excited about this guest today is because she is a complete inspiration for me and for those of us who work with her. The Hawaii Innocence Project is a fabulous social justice project, and we want to just make everyone else aware of how fabulous it is and the work that Professor Hinch is doing. So welcome, Jenny. Thank you very much. So talking about the Hawaii Innocence Project would be too quick. <laughs> I want to talk about how you first got to the William S. Richardson School of Law and visioned the Hawaii Innocence Project being here. Well, this goes back quite some time. I, I came here in 1993. I had been a graduate teaching fellow in law at uh, Temple University School of Law before that. And before that, I had a career as an art teacher. <laughs> so uh, I was 40 years old when I graduated from law school. Fantastic. And I clerked for a judge, a federal judge in Norfolk, Virginia, and practiced in Indiana for a while. So was your clerkship and your practice related to criminal law, or did you do a number of things? Well, I clerked for the then chief judge um, of the U U.S. District Court in Norfolk, mm -hmm. the uh, Eastern District mm -hmm. of Virginia, Norfolk Division, I should say. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had all kinds of cases there. We had criminal cases. We had um, civil cases, all kinds of things. Yeah. But your background is not just in those cases. It, you, no. You've done a lot of things. When I was in practice, I had, we had a general practice, so we mm -hmm. did whatever wa walked in the door. We had family cases, we had um, water rights cases, mm -hmm. had uh, some civil rights cases. I also worked at a jail for about three years before law school. Yeah. That's an interesting point about your background. Working at a prison, mm -hmm. is that connected to why you thought the Hawaii Innocence Project was something worth pursuing here? Yes, it, that was the first time I really had insight into the fact that there might be innocent people in prison. And at the time, there was no Innocence Project. This was back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And when, the, when Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld started the Innocence Project nationwide, I remember that Barry sent an email to the uh, criminal law uh, faculty you know, email mm -hmm. list just asking whether there was interest in starting other projects in other states because, of course, they were getting inquiries from everywhere, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And our former dean, Larry Foster, and I actually talked to Peter Neufeld a few times. At the time, it wasn't feasible mm -hmm. to start, um, but since then, we've, I've been very fortunate to partner with uh, Brooke Hart and Bill Harrison and Susan Arnett. And uh, with the help from the law school and many other people, we've been able to get it off the ground. That's fantastic. I want to touch on one more <coughs> personal sure. issue. You said that you went back to law school mm -hmm. at the age of? I was 37 when 37 I started. 37 when yes. you started and 40 when you graduated. Mm -hmm. So that bodes well for anyone in the community who thinks, you know, I've only been in one career. Can I do another? Well, I was hesitant about going from teaching studio art. I was, and my master's degree was in etching and engraving. I was hesitant about going from, from that field into law, but I was drawn to law. I had actually worked in a law school while I was in graduate school mm -hmm. in, in Iowa. And uh, I was attracted to it at the time, but I thought, oh, I can't really change. But I, it, kept, it kept pulling at me, you know? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was still interested in it. So finally I thought, well, in three years, I'm going to be 40 with a law degree. I'll be 40 without a law degree. I'll so still be 40. <laughs> I'll be 40 either way, so let's go. Exactly. And I haven't looked back since. I'm so happy with it. Well, art's loss is our law's gain, no, and particularly you. those who rely on your service. So let's talk a little bit about the Hawaii Innocence Project. How difficult was it to start here in Hawaii, this project? Well, there are some logistical issues. Of course, most of the prisoners are, are 
who we deal with at least are housed now in Arizona. At the time, many of them were in Mississippi, which is even farther and harder to get to from here. Mm -hmm. There are issues of funding, and so we just started on a shoestring, and we figured we'll do what we can, and if, even if we can't do everything. We got a lot of help from another law school in mm -hmm. Southern California. Mm -hmm. and they did a lot of work with us at the beginning, and then eventually it became better to just stand on our own two feet, them. but they were very, very helpful in getting us started. And so what does HIP do? Well, we investigate claims of actual innocence, and by actual innocence, I mean the person did not do the crime, was not involved in the crime, didn't help with the crime, had mm -hmm. nothing to do with the crime. And in some cases, uh, there was no crime. Mm -hmm. And those are the only cases we take. We just don't have the resources to take on legal defenses. I mean, we do get inquiries from people who say, I was convicted, but it was self-defense. Mm -hmm. We can't handle something that it's where they actually did the conduct, but they have a legal defense, even though it's a very valid defense, obviously. Mm -hmm. We just, we have to draw the line somewhere, and we, we can only handle what we can handle, so we limit our cases to people who have a claim that they actually did not do or participate in the crime. I think some people in our community would be surprised that innocent people actually are arrested and incarcerated for the length of time that they are. Well, it is, it is surprising, and I have to say, you know, I mean, police and prosecutors get it right most of the time, but no human system is free from error. Mm -hmm. Everyone makes mistakes, and the system has some mechanisms for catching errors, but it doesn't catch all of the errors, so we're kind of here as a backup. So you fill a very important role in the criminal justice system, and that is this investigative role. We do investigate, and our criteria are, we don't ask ourselves whether we believe a claim, whether we disbelieve a claim, because everyone who's ever been exonerated looked guilty until they were exonerated. <laughs> right, you know, they wouldn't exactly. have been convicted if they didn't look guilty. Mm -hmm. So we don't make that assessment up front. We just ask ourselves, suppose this person is telling the truth, might there be some evidence that we could find that might establish that? Mm -hmm. Some cases it's DNA evidence, um, different different mm -hmm. forensic sciences are being developed all of the time. Mm -hmm. There are a variety of things. And sometimes we have a case where there's just nothing to find. I mean, no evidence to be had, so it can never be determined. So it seems that you, Brooke Hart, uh, William Harrison, you really play an important role in our criminal justice system. Were there people who didn't want to see HIP uh, actually uh, stand on its own two feet? Were there some opponents to it? Not opponents as such. There are people who have expressed the opinion that there are no innocent people in prison and mm -hmm. would that it were so, you know, right. but there are, there are some. Mm -hmm. As I say, it's, it's somewhat analogous to an emergency room. Most of the people who show up at an emergency room with a headache don't have a brain tumor, but you're remiss if you don't screen for that. Right. And for that one in however many hundred or however many thousand who actually, where there's a serious problem, mm -hmm. the system needs to be able, to, it needs people to uh, look into that and if there's evidence to be had to bring it to light. So how do you staff the Hawaii Innocence Project? What's the model? Well, we are established as a law school clinic. Um, our dean has been very helpful in providing us with space and uh, so forth. And we have, I have an associate director who has a full teaching load, but he is extremely helpful when he can be. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have wonderful volunteer faculty, Brooke, Bill, and Susan, um, particularly Brooke and Bill, because of course Susan cannot take private clients since she's with the public defender's office, but okay. she helps teach the seminar and advises and so forth. And she's been a wonderful mentor to students. It's probably a good learning experience for her as well. Well, it is for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, we all learn a lot from it. And there's nothing like teaching something to, you know, keep you on your toes, as you know very well, That's of course. Right. And uh, I think the clinical experience in the Innocence Project has been really helpful. I, I see a large percentage of our graduates finding really good jobs. Um, one of our not to too long ago grads is now with the Federal Public Defender's Office in Excellent. San Francisco, which is a highly competitive placement. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, several of the recent hires at the public defenders, several of the recent hires at various prosecutors' offices have been our alums, of which I'm very proud. And you also have had success in placing people who served as source attorneys for you. So young people who come into the program to assist, you have gone on to do some amazing Absolutely, things as well. Absolutely, yes, yes. We've Fantastic. been very fortunate. <laughs> so when the students get this clinical experience, are they ready for the, the emotional challenge? Well, it, it is an emotional challenge because uh, I, I think most of law school, of course, one never meets a client. And just Monday night, we, we had a visit from someone whose exoneration, his complete exoneration is still in progress, but mm -hmm. he has been released at least on parole based on information that we've been able to obtain. And uh, he came with, with his children and with his wife and with his ex-wife also, who's the mother of two of his children. And they all shared you know, what they had gone through with this wrongful arrest and wrongful conviction. And even though the person who originally accused him has, has recanted, um, our client has passed not only a private polygraph of Jack Tramarco, but the ones that the paroling authority has, mm -hmm. you know, Nonetheless, the process does take a, a lot more time. It's not at all like on television. <laughs> <laughs> Nor is it like other clinics in the traditional law school experience. Like you said, you are dealing with people who've gone through serious emotional, psychic harm mm -hmm. from wrongful conviction. Yes, I'm just thinking of the, the, the two daughters. They were ages two and three mm -hmm. when this client was arrested originally. and. Once he was released, they had no memory of him. Mm -hmm. They didn't even remember him. Mm -hmm. And they're all still working through that, and it's a tribute to the strength of that family. What do you do to prepare students for this kind of emotional encounter? Well, there's no real way to prepare them, but we do try to let them know early in the semester what this will involve. Mm -hmm. It's not just you know, show up and then take an exam. It's not just note taking as some courses may be viewed by students. Right. It's, mu it's much more intense and some students do not find that comfortable and it's not for everybody, of course. And the last question before we go to break, how do you connect for students all the things that they're learning in classes to then assist with this live representation? How do you bring it all together? Well, that is one of the biggest challenges because the cases do go on for years. So in a sense, the student is always coming in in the middle of something. Right. But they do participate in answering new inquiries, screening new applications, as well as working on the cases that have passed the screening stage and are actively being pursued. Excellent. Well, when we come back, I hope to talk to you more about the inner workings of the Hawaii Innocence Project in education and social justice. This is Danielle Conway. You're watching Life in the Law on the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. Welcome back. I'm Danielle Conway. This is Life in the Law in the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. My guest is Professor Virginia Hench. She is a professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law as well. She directs the Hawaii Innocence Project and our topic today is in education and social justice. So let's talk a little bit more about real life cases going on at your project. What's on tap? Well, there are some, of course, that we can't <clears throat> cannot discuss, and 
others that are coming in, we've, we have some interesting inquiries that we're waiting on forensic reports. And, um, but the case that I was just referring to, the client that we met, you know, we are pursuing um, an appeal in his case, an appeal from the denial of his Rule 40 petition. As you probably know, Rule 40 is the state equivalent of a habeas. So, mm, okay. so we're hoping to get him a new trial. Uh, in Hawaii, there is no mechanism for just having a declaration that the person is actually innocent. I mean, there's just no rule that provides for that. So, as in Alvin Jardine's case, all we could do is ask for a new trial. And of course, the state, once they knew the process, uh, that the DNA didn't match, they did, they chose not to prosecute him again. Um, but. It would be nice if, if, like some other states, if Hawaii had a provision for mm -hmm. a, a declaration of actual innocence. Right, because that is that psychically means something. It does mean something. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. Well, there are some states in which, I mean, it's a very high standard, of course, and it's not sufficient necessarily that your case was overturned on procedural grounds. Mm -hmm. But when there is something like DNA, which in, in Alvin Jardine's case, it was a home invasion, single perpetrator, sexual assault, rape. Mm -hmm. There were 11 witnesses who saw Alvin at a different location at the time. There was an eyewitness misidentification, which I think, I, I feel quite sure the victim I, was sincere, but she just was mistaken, mm -hmm. and largely because of the procedures, the outdated procedures that were used at the time. Mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, DNA testing became available, and almost all of the evidence had been destroyed, but one item of evidence survived. It had the male DNA on it along with the victim's DNA, and mm. we had a full profile, and it was not Alvin's profile. We couldn't even have been a relative, according mm -hmm. to the um, DNA experts. Interesting. So you see science playing a role. You also see chain of custody and making sure that custodial processes are intact. That's that very plays important. A role. And of course, we don't know what technology will be discovered, you know, tomorrow or next year. So right now we think about DNA, but that wasn't thought about in, let's say, the 1980s. It was barely heard of by then. So we don't know what could be discovered now. So it is very important always to preserve evidence. Also because in a lot of the exoneration cases, the actual perpetrator has been discovered. And of course, as a citizen, as, as, as a former crime victim myself, mm -hmm. I would like to see if anyone is going to prison, I would like for it to be the right, the right person. person. Yes, yes, I don't think that's a tough concept. Well, and you have a second victimization when that is not the case, when people are there wrongly. Exactly, and you victimize the entire family, and also, of course, you're rewarding the actual perpetrator. Mm -hmm. Because once you fixed on the wrong person, even if in good faith, once the wrong person is convicted, mm -hmm. They're not looking anymore. So you see all of these news reports and even documentaries about how prosecutors seem to lock into the notion that the person they have is actually the perpetrator. Can you identify why that happens? Why are, why are our prosecutors sometimes so invested in that approach? Well, I do think, I, I don't think it's peculiar to prosecutors. I think we're all all prone to that, we can try to fight against it, but it, it is a psychological phenomenon that's widely studied and we tend to, once we form an opinion about something, we tend to see things in the light that supports the opinion that we've already formed. Mm -hmm. And it is just basic human nature, which is why we always need to be open to the possibility that no matter how sure we are, we can be wrong. Yeah. We can all be wrong. What can people do who are faced with the kinds of ta challenges that some of your clients are faced with. What is it that they can do to, to bring more attention to their cases, to get the type of assistance that you provide? We do need some, some legal reforms to be sure. Uh, we currently have no compensation whatsoever if a person is wrongly convicted. And uh, I, there have been compensation bills introduced in different years in the legislature. They have not so far been passed. I am hopeful that they will be. Mm -hmm. Many states uh, have compensation, mm -hmm. very varying degrees. I think Texas has the Texas and Illinois, I believe, have the most 
comprehensive mm -hmm. compensation packages. But there are criteria one has to meet. You, you don't qualify simply because your conviction was overturned. You have to meet certain criteria, you apply for it. That's right. In California, it's so much per year that you were wrongly incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And the logic is simple. I mean, if the, if the state accidentally knocks down your house, they have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So even if they don't act maliciously, if they knock down your life, <laughs> they should be. They should at least help you get back on your feet, in my opinion. Yeah, they should be held to account for that. So what has uh, Mr. Jardine and others who you've helped, what have they done post this experience? What's their life as they try to get back into to society? Life for exonerees is very, very difficult, even if they have compensation, because, you know, in, in Alvin's case, he had been out of society for 20 years, and he was age 20 when he was arrested. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different world. He'd never used a cell phone. Mm -hmm. I mean, he... Yeah, basic thing. He didn't know his daughter, who was 20 when he got, mm -hmm. when she, when he got out. And uh, he's lucky that he has an extended family. He had family members who could take him in and he could live with them for a time. Um, the client that I was mentioning who came to the class on Monday has a very strong support from you know his, his family and his children and mm -hmm. so forth. But it's still very difficult. Large numbers of exonerees suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder because it's I can't even imagine what it would be like. I can try to visualize it, but I can't even think what it would be like. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be bad enough to be in prison if you actually did what you're in there for, but I think it would probably be easier to reconcile yourself to it than if you did nothing. Right, right. So yeah, you have trust issues, you have issues where you feel people are just against you completely. Some people are so afraid, you know, that they want to make sure that they're around people all the time in case they're accused of something mm -hmm. else. One a woman I know of who I've, I've met collects receipts from every place she goes just in case she has to prove where she was at a certain time. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's very little counseling available. That would be something that would ideally be available. There were some social workers who rallied and provided some services for Alvin and for some others, but so it's that, a very difficult situation. It needs attention because it affects yeah. the entire family. It doesn't just affect the exoneree, and especially in tightly, tightly knit community like Hawaii, um, the ripple effects are huge. So there's actually an opportunity oh, for yes. some uh, partners to come in Absolutely. and support what you're doing with the Hawaii Innocence Project. Absolutely. Okay. And nationally, there is now a, a growing focus on some issues that are very particular to indigenous communities whose you know, attachment to the cultural background and practices has been disrupted by incarceration. It's a big problem in Alaska as well mm -hmm. as Hawaii. And so that's starting to be looked at too. So it's a particular problem in Hawaii because people are in prison so far from home mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. visiting is virtually impossible. Exactly. Um, but not only visiting, you mentioned off air that some of the toughest cases come when people are off island and the crime scene is off island. That's true. And you can't get to it readily. So you have additional expenses here. Yes, there are, there are difficult logistical issues. We don't just jump in the car, you mm -hmm. know, and go talk to a witness. We have to book a flight if, mm -hmm. if the case happens to be off island or if the witness is living elsewhere, which is frequently the case. So uh, certainly if anyone is inclined to uh, offer support, uh, we would welcome that. <laughs> it, would, it would absolutely it be would welcome. It would absolutely be welcome. Um, be our, our, our website is Innocence Project Hawaii. Org. That's excellent. And you have actually a grant from the federal government, but that do. grant doesn't cover everything. It doesn't cover everything. It's a very generous grant. It's for two years, and it covers certain things. Uh, it will, we have just hired a student researcher, and we're in the process of looking for a postgraduate fellow who will probably start this summer. But for example, if I want to take all of the students to a crime scene on Kauai, for example, mm -hmm. 
they really need to see it in many cases, most cases, just so they understand the testimony they're reading in the transcripts. Mm -hmm. Yet, it's difficult to write to a grant office in Washington and say, you know, I need six round trip tickets so six students who are working on this case can fly to the neighbor islands and, and right. see this location. It's, right. if, we, if we were all on one piece of ground, we could jump in the car and, mm -hmm. and just go. It wouldn't even be an expense item except for a few gallons of gas. But it can be $1,200 just for the plane tickets for a day trip. Which makes social justice even more expensive. Particularly if you're not on Oahu, yes, that's exactly. absolutely true. Exactly, that's a huge concern. And so the way that you could bridge this is if people in the community recognize the value of the service and decided, you know, that's something I want to support and contribute to. Definitely, it would be a, it would be a benefit not only to us and our students, but very definitely to the com community. And one thing I'd like to emphasize is the more exonerees I meet, this can happen to anyone. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. may be more vulnerable if you live at the edges of society, but mm -hmm. there are business people, there are school teachers. Mm -hmm. There is a woman in Illinois who was on death row for a time for killing her son. Her son was killed by a serial killer mm -hmm. and it was later established without any doubt. Mm -hmm. It can happen to anyone, anyone. anytime. And, and you would hope if it happened to you, there'd be someone like you. I would hope. And I would a hope. Hawaii and And all project. of the people who help me because it's not just me. And so Brooke uh, Hart helps you. Tremendously. William Harrison. Talk about these individuals and the time that they're donating. They donate private. so much time. Brooke, Bill, and Susan receive a small stipend for assisting in teaching the seminar, but they, they donate so much of their time, whether to drafting pleadings, appearing in court. Mm -hmm taking depositions, mm -hmm. sometimes in California, other islands, because sometimes witnesses have moved away in the time, you know, since the case That's was right. held. So they, we could not do it without our volunteer attorneys. So Susan's full name is? Susan Arnett. Arnett, and she's at the? Yes, she's a senior supervising senior. attorney at the Public uh, Defender's Office, and I, I has, hasten to say she does not do mm -hmm. representation, which would be against her, the regulations for a public okay. defender. But she helps teach but the she class. She helps teach the class and provides tremendous knowledge to mm -hmm. the students. Three additional people helping does not seem like enough. <laughs> what do you need to make this a full-fledged? Could, could use a full-time paralegal, okay. could use a staff attorney, could use funding to have continuity because it's mm -hmm. difficult, you know, to, to, to hire the kind of people that we need with the skill set that we need. Right when you can't offer them anything beyond the grant period, That's for example. Right. That's right. So if someone were seeing this and they said, you know, I've had a wonderful career, I would even like to come and be a paralegal. And that would be outstanding. Excellent. I'd love to hear from them. So the Hawaii Innocence Project would look forward to having more volunteers to assist in the excellent social justice work that they're doing. Yes. Let's take a break and right. we'll come Thank back. You. I'm speaking with Professor Virginia Hench from the Hawaii Innocence Project based at the William S. Richardson School of Law. This is Life in the Law on the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Ar on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back. I'm Danielle Conway. This is Life in the Law on the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. My guest today is Professor Virginia Hench. She's the director of the Hawaii Innocence Project at the William S. Richardson School of Law. We're going to shift gears and talk about the cases you, you can't take. That, that must be difficult, too. Well, it is very difficult. I mean, of course, we get inquiries from cases that don't fit within our definition, such as cases from other jurisdictions, which we refer to the appropriate project in that jurisdiction. 
But in some cases, there the evidence has not been preserved. So there's nothing we can do. And there's one particular case that still sticks in my mind. It was a bank robbery case. And in this case, there was a sketch done from one of your typical blurry bank photographs. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They could use better high-tech cameras, if you ask me. But mm -hmm. uh, someone decided, well, that looks like Mr. So-and-so. Well, OK, except that Mr. So-and-so was locked up in La Maca at the time, uh, which is the work release facility, but he wasn't released that day. Mm -hmm. He was there for the morning head count. He was there for the afternoon head count. He played cards with a guy for a couple of hours in between. Mm. So you would think they would look for someone else. Mm -hmm. But the, the theory was, and this went to trial and a conviction, the theory was that he had somehow gotten out of Laumaca. Apparently, he must have jumped over the fence, mm -hmm. ran about a half a mile. He acquired dreadlocks in the process, which mm -hmm. he didn't have before. He got rid of a big, conspicuous scar in his arm, because you can see on the still photos from the bank that the robber does not have a scar. He's wearing a sleeveless top. And you can see his arm very clearly. There's no scar. The robber had a very distinctive bandana with stars on it. You know, mm -hmm. most bandanas do not have stars. Mm -hmm. He also had a gun, which, as a general rule, are not issued to inmates at La Maca or elsewhere. Well, that's a so, good thing. So he, yes, mm -hmm. uh, so he acquired this between the location of the jail mm -hmm. and the um, bank, mm -hmm. robbed the bank. So then he lost the money, he lost the gun, he lost the distinctive bandana, he got his scar back, got rid of the dreadlocks, apparently jumped back over the fence, Right. got back to the card game, got back for the head count. Right. All in that time. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can't help thinking it wasn't this guy, you know? Right. And so we tried to find the bandana. We tried to find various items of evidence. We actually found someone who looks much more like the blurry pictures. We can't be sure it's right. he. The guy was a career bank robber. He was out at the time. He was right. robbing banks in the area. And he actually said, yeah, I might have done that one. I don't remember. I robbed a lot right. of banks. Right. I... But there was nothing we can do with this, this person oh. uh, because the standards are very high, as yes. they should be. But they may be a, a little higher than they should be because how do you even attack a conviction when, based on a, essentially a hypothetical. And when you have to prove the existence of something that's not there. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> because if the bandana had been preserved, for example, there might well be sweat and, and DNA. DNA exactly, or hair. Right. And if you have hair follicles, of course, you can get a full profile. You could still potentially do mitochondrial testing if you don't have the root. But And you couldn't take that case. No. I mean, we spent a lot of time trying to track down where evidence might, might be. Uh, but at the end of the day, there was nothing we could do, and that case still bothers me. Of course it does, because there's someone sitting. I really think that he didn't do it. Yeah, and that is the definition exactly of what you're doing in the Innocence Project. And the other thing is, he was due to get out in a few weeks. So why would he do this and, now? And they, they, they searched, of course, the whole area. They never found the money, and never mm -hmm. found the gun. I mean, how mm -hmm. could he have done that? How could he have done that? So, yeah, that, that's an impossible case, and I can imagine why that haunts you. Yeah. And so there must, there must be other instances that I know you can't talk about. So how do you, how do you individually process that? Well, I'm very fortunate, uh, again, to have wonderful colleagues who um, we are our own uh, <laughs> team, I guess. Yeah. And we're part of the net network. The inter it's actually international now. It extends to multiple countries. And we have access to each other on phone and internet, and we meet once or twice a year. Excellent. And uh, there are all kinds of sessions. They have sessions where exonerees can counsel other exonerees on how they've handled certain things. We're hoping to get you know, some, some of our people to be able to go to that, because it's going to be in Portland, Oregon this year. Mm, so it's relatively close. Exactly. And Another thing people could do is they could donate miles, Hawaiian miles. That you know? would be fantastic. Because Hawaiian has direct flights, and mm -hmm. so then we could fly a few people who we couldn't afford to fly out there otherwise. And what is the value of exonerees discussing their experience with other exonerees? What comes out of that? Well, nobody else, including their family members, really 
knows what they go through. I mean, I can't even imagine, and I, you know, I talk to them, various exonerees and pending clients, mm -hmm. you know, many times a week, and that, those are the only people in the world who have been through the same thing. There are exonerees, there's a fellow named Bill Dillon who was released after 35 years in mm -hmm. prison in Florida. Mm -hmm. He now has a band called Exoneree. You can find them on the, on the oh, internet. Right. He's, got some, <laughs> he's got some CDs. Everyone in his band is an exoneree. That's excellent. Yeah. So it's, it's a kind of team counseling and support mm -hmm. system. And practical matters too for those who get, reward, mm -hmm. get awards, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, Management, because of course, as one exoneree mentioned to me, he hadn't opened a door for himself mm -hmm. in ten years. You know, it's staggering to think what people are deprived of, particularly when they've been. You lose your life skills. You, lo you lose everything. Yes. And then to be allowed back into society, it's very, very difficult. It's amazing. It's Rip Van Winkle, but with a stigma as well. Exactly. Because, because many people never believe that you were actually innocent. That is, is astounding. Your, it's heartbreaking. Your program is called the Innocence Project. You would think that this would go a long way to change the culture of people as they accept exonerees back into society. I think the... I think people are starting to recognize that there really are mistakes made, mm -hmm. but we're not there yet. There's, there's still room for more work. There's more. <laughs> so I'm constantly amazed at how much time you invest in the Hawaii Innocence Project. How much time do you spend day to day, week to week, month to month? It's probably a good thing that I don't really keep track. Okay, good. <laughs> I will say last week, one night I got home at 2.30 a.m. and yeah. uh, several other nights I got home after 11. And a couple of mornings in the last five or six days I was at the office before 7. Mm -hmm. So so we're lucky you have a zeal for this kind <laughs> of work. <laughs> it would be hard to sustain if you didn't have a passion for it. But we could use help, however large or small, from anyone who wants to help. So tell me a little bit about Brooke Hart. He's a character. He is an inspiration. Mm -hmm. He works so hard. He's so dedicated. He, he and Bill, you know, they have such busy practices, and they find time for the court hearings and the filings. And Brooke, especially, I mean, provides you know this, his staff from time to time when mm -hmm. we need to are made available for to help with research mm -hmm. and things like that. But I mean, that's a big burden for him because he's a sole practitioner, and he is paying them. He's not just donating his own time, that's right. which obviously he could bill for. We couldn't afford him if we had to pay his hourly rate, but uh, <laughs> thankfully he is so generous and so is Bill with yes. the, their time. Well, Brooke Hart is definitely an anchor in our community Absolutely. in Hawaii and he was really instrumental in helping you bring the Innocence Project. Here. Absolutely. We could not have started with without the team that we have. Um, Brooke was nominated for the Morris Dees Award a few years ago. And, mm -hmm. Although it, he didn't wasn't the ultimate mm -hmm. um, selectee, it's well deserved. Well, well deserved, yes. Well, fantastic. We have one more break we have to go to. We'll okay. come back. We're speaking with Professor Virginia Hench. We're talking about the Hawaii Innocence Project and ed Education and Social Justice. I'm Danielle Conway. You're watching Life in the Law on the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for Think Tech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone Number 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone Program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone Program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Horry. Mahalo. By good, you mean? This is Danielle Conway. You're watching Life and the Law on the Think Tech Live Network streaming series. We have a conversation going on off and on air. Yes, we do. And I think one of the questions off air was, what role do police officers play in 
helping to either correct situations or do they exacerbate situations or do they have their own processes to help you investigate? Do they lend a hand in, in trying to get these questions of innocence resolved? Well, as you can imagine, there, there's, there is a gamut um, there of attitudes in any area. I, I would say that um, as far as I can see, the police and prosecutors very much want to get the right person. Mm -hmm. I, I do not think it's the case that they want to get the wrong person, but they're as human as the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things the police can do is they could adopt a slightly more progressive um, procedures, uh, particularly for things like eyewitness identification. Mm -hmm. This is an area that has been the subject of rigorous scientific study by psychologists across the country, actually internationally. And it's very well established that just making a few changes in the process, one of which would be not having the person who's showing the photo line up know who the suspect is mm. because apparently even when one tries not to there are nonverbal cues that are given despite you know the Makes officer's best sense. effort mm -hmm. and that leads to misidentifications and of course that undercuts the conviction of the actual perpetrator too mm -hmm. when you have a misidentification another thing that's a very simple thing to do is to show the photos in sequence mm -hmm. as opposed to at the same time mm -hmm. because the way our minds work when we see the photos at the same time we tend to go to the one who is most like our memory. Mm. Whereas when we see them one at a time, based on the studies, we're more likely to actually be comparing that face with what's in our head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it either matches or doesn't match. I see. And it's, it seems to be something in the way our brains are wired. And they're finding out also that eyewitnesses are highly suggestible. From time to time, we've We've done a little experiment in, in one of my classes mm -hmm. where we've had someone come in and cause some kind of disruption. Right. And one time we actually had Dog the Bounty Hunter and his crew show up in class. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. and they <laughs> arrested my teaching assistant at the time, who was in on it, my, okay. and my dad. <laughs> we didn't want to traumatize him. Right. But, you know, everyone in the class knew who they were from TV. This is when their show was at its peak, you know, right. some years ago. and. Yet we didn't get an, a single accurate description. I mean, the heights were off. Mm -hmm. One person's tattoos were described as on another person. The number of people were wrong. What they were wearing was wrong. It mm -hmm. was so inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And the students, of course, were not, I mean, they were seated comfortably in chairs. Right, there was and no the stressor. That's right, they had an opportunity to deserve, I mean, right. to observe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had a gun pointed at me. Mm -hmm. it's, um, that tends to be all you see in mm -hmm. that case. But in this case, they were just observers. And again, they were observing celebrities that they knew. Mm -hmm. One of them saw a cowboy hat that wasn't there. Nobody in that crew was wearing Amazing. a cowboy hat, you know, mm -hmm. but it was dutifully described. Right. And despite one's best efforts, you know, we are not good observers. Our minds fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm. And you can think of eyewitness testimony as kind of like trace evidence. If it's contaminated when it's collected, it doesn't matter how well it's preserved, preserved. later. <laughs> exactly. You know, if it's contaminated at the source, it's going to be wrong all the way through. So right. it's really important. That would be the single thing that they, they could do. The other would be, because of the problem of false confessions, especially with juveniles, mm -hmm. um, would be to anytime police are talking to a witness or a suspect to record the whole thing. Mm. Some of the departments of their own free will will observe, will record the final statement. Few, if any, mm -hmm. do the entire questioning, which may be multiple hours. Mm -hmm. And that would be a best practice that many departments have, have adopted. I'm gonna go out here on a limb and, and <laughs> <Go> <laughs> explore my own personal opinion okay. uh, and see what you think about it. I, I find troubling a lot of these reality shows or these displays of uh, criminal investigations on television because I think sometimes they're slanted in a certain direction, there's bias involved. Is it more important to show people how the process works or is there something that should be preserved in the process where we don't sort of sensationalize it in that way? 
Well, I don't know if it's possible to uh, to get away from you know the sensational aspect of television. I mean, shows like CSI are and you know they're entertaining, mm -hmm. like Star Trek. But I don't mm -hmm. believe either one of them. Right. You know? <laughs> I, mean, I enjoy them both. Exactly. But you can't take them seriously. It's, okay. it's those are science fiction. The others mm -hmm. are selective, let's say, in what they present. Mm -hmm. um, so they can you can. It's kind of like the story of. You know, people who perceive the elephant without sight, and they, one of them thinks the elephant's like a rope because he's got a hold of it by the tail, and the mm -hmm. other one thinks it's like a snake because he's got a hold of it by the, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the trunk. Oh, and you. yeah, and so TV can be kind of like that by zeroing in on one thing, even if it's presented correctly, mm -hmm. by focusing on something and taking it out of context, you can totally Easily. change the perception. Yeah, and I only ask that question because, you know, I wonder how people who are not acquainted as you are with the criminal justice system, how they would respond if they were ever in a type of situation, like some of your clients find themselves in or even some of the victims. Well, you know, the one client that comes to mind was uh, a decorated Navy officer. He was a military policeman. He had received stellar commendations. He rescued someone in the first Gulf War who mm. fell off a battleship. Mm. He found, the, found her in the dark and mm. rescued her. And he describes himself now as having been a very law and order person. He would never have believed that an innocent person could be convicted right. until it happened to him. Right. And even when he was arrested, you know, his attitude was, you know, I don't need a lawyer. I don't need to mm -hmm. do anything. I haven't done anything wrong. You know, they're going to straighten this out. Yeah, I'll be it, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it I, wasn't. I would say, you mm -hmm. know, I'm not saying the system always gets it wrong. It certainly doesn't. It right. mostly gets it right. But if you're in that, right. if you're in that small percentage where they get it wrong, we don't want someone getting away with an actual crime if we, you know, if if it can be proven, and we certainly do not want someone innocent going to prison for a crime they didn't do. That's in no one's interest. So we're going to end the interview with you telling us a little bit about what it means to run this program and what it means for social justice. It is a big responsibility. I, I wake up at night thinking about the people who are in prison and waking up in prison every morning and can I do a little bit more and can I investigate more and is there something else we can do on this case or that case. But I think it's very important not to just assume that our systems function perfectly all the time. And mm -hmm. Uh, I think we can move towards greater partnerships. I think as as happened in Texas, for example, the Dallas DA now has a conviction integrity unit. Mm. And as a matter of routine, when one of, they have multiple innocence projects in Texas, and, and when one of them comes up with a case where they've got some evidence, they, they, the DA will sit down with them mm. and or someone from that unit mm -hmm. and talk about okay, maybe this case really should be set aside, and they will join in the process. They don't perceive it anymore. At, at first, they perceived everything as a threat to them. Right. It's like, you're attacking them. You're saying we did something wrong, but everybody makes mistakes. That's right, and everybody benefits when mistakes are caught early. Absolutely so. Mm -hmm. I think it strengthens people's faith in the system to know mm -hmm. that the system is not afraid to correct itself when there's evidence. Right. Well, you truly are an inspiring woman. Oh, thank you. You are doing the community a great, great service, and we are so happy that you're doing it at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Thank you so much. I want to thank Professor Virginia Hench from our law school. She directs the Hawaii Innocence Project. I want to thank her for appearing today. Thank you very much for having me. And please state the website again in case people want to visit. It's Innocence Project Hawaii. Dot org. This is all one word. Thank you. <laughs> this is Danielle Conway. You've been watching Life in the Law on a Think Tech Live Network streaming series.